It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Anyone who is navigating grief often feels like there's no end to the pain. Life as they know it is over, and there doesn't feel like there's a way out. Today's guest, Karen Johnson's professional career as a federal judge came to an abrupt halt when she lost her 27-year-old son to a heroin overdose. After that, Karen did the unexpected. She quit her lifetime appointment, sold her house with all her belongings, and traveled the world, finding a healing practice along the way. Karen joins us today to share her journey of transformation. Karen is a graduate of Georgetown Law Center, a former Fulbright Scholar in Afghanistan, and she holds master's degrees in public health and public and international affairs. She's a retired federal administrative law judge who practiced for more than 30 years. She's also a former U.S. Army officer. Karen is the author of the book, Living Grieving, Using Energy Medicine to Alchemize Grief and Loss. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Joan. Thank you for having me. So, Karen, I, I want to begin by saying that I'm so sorry for your loss. I've experienced tremendous loss in my life as well. So I understand some of what you went through, and I know that a lot of our listeners understand that pain as well. Tell us about your son and what it is that you experienced at that time. So, um, you know, my 27-year-old son, Ben, was struggling like many young men. He wasn't an addict. Um, but he was really struggling in life and trying to start a business and deciding to go back to school and just a lot of different things. So <clears throat> I knew that I needed to have a big conversation with him. But I went on vacation first, and I thought, I'll, I'll deal with this when I get back. I knew that he was struggling and, and hurting. But um, So I was in South Korea, actually, when I got the call from a detective that said, hey, are you at home? And I said, no, I'm in South Korea. Why? It's about your son. What? Did he have an accident? What happened? Never occurred to me. He said, no, I'm sorry. He's, 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 he died. And I said, from what? Of course, it was a big shock and all of that that you can imagine. Um, and so it took me a really long time to get back to South Korea. It's like 13 and a half hours, different time zone. So the next morning, I was able to get a flight out. And, um, and he appeared to me right in front of me, just like his regular grinning self. And then kind of faded away. And I frantically called my ex-husband and said, you got to contact the ME. I think he's alive. I think he's trying to get out. I think, you know, all the things that you think, you know. And so um, the ME checked and said, no, I'm sorry, he's gone. And so that was really the beginning of sometimes death is a doorway. It was the beginning of a spiritual path for me um, that started with me seeing my son and wanting to contact him more and wanting to engage with him. And I ended up finding an evolutionary astrologer who said, gosh, I had another woman who had a reading like yours that became a shaman. And I'm like, a shaman? Wow. Never heard about that in my left-wing world in Washington, (laughs) D.C., hanging out with judges and all sorts of other people. And so Three weeks later, I found myself on a plane to the to start classes with the Four Winds, and and that was the beginning of really a whole transformative life for me. Why do you think that happened to you? And and you know, I ask that because I'm a similar type of person. I came from a corporate background, very structured life, and yet over the past ten years, after going through so much pain and loss. I've started to understand the type of work that you do and, and, and really believe in something I knew nothing about more than a decade ago. So why do you think yeah. this happened to you? Oh, gosh, I think it was a gift. I mm-hmm. think it was a gift from my son. And I think it was a gift from God, the universe, whatever you want to call it. I think it it um, it, it was one of those opportunities for me to have a spiritual path that I didn't have. And I think that the destiny, his destiny here on earth was complete. 
And my destiny was to learn how to live and grow without him and find that journey of creating a new life out of the ashes of the old one that honors our loved one. Do you think that that is really what saved you having that belief? I lost a brother when he was 14, and my parents basically died with my brother. They continued living, yeah. but there was a big part of them that, that went with him. Do you think the way that you started to be able to view this saved you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, we change our perception, we change our beliefs, we turn to change our life. And I think seeing him and feeling him and knowing that there is actually life after death was, was not something I believed in before that. So knowing that there is life after death and there's a whole big life after death allowed me to um, actually shift my perspective. And then I believe, you know, it really helped me to write the book. And much of the book is downloaded to me um, over time. And so it's a way for people to go on this journey through grieving, through, um, and it's our own journey. And it takes as long as it's going to take. And what you're talking about is so common. People become very stuck in their grief. And they don't know how to get out of it. They don't know what to do or what to become. A lot of books will tell you, you need to go to a move on a move, go to see a movie or go on a date or go forward or do this or do that. Mostly people say, I'm not ready. I can't. And so my book is about how can we find ways to become unstuck from our grief. And there's 16 practices in my book that talk about things like non-judgment, non-suffering, non-attachment, practicing beauty <clears throat> that allow us to find out where we're stuck then become lighter for more practices, and then awaken to this from the nightmare, really, mm -hmm. and then create a new life, create a new life from the ashes of the old. And so it's a long, it's a process, but it's our own process, and we each are different, stuck in a different place. You were able to develop this from traveling. And Back then, when you made the decision to basically give up the life that you knew, how did you come to that decision? I mean, you were a federal judge, you were an army officer. This doesn't sound like someone who would make that type of decision. No, not at all. Um, I had begun to um, do some shamat work with sh shamanism and take a few classes. And, and I realized ultimately that my life as a federal judge just didn't fulfill me anymore. I, I just... I had been thrown out of the matrix, so to speak, with my son's death. And so nothing made sense anymore. And I felt like I just couldn't do both things. I couldn't be a shaman and be a federal judge in Washington, D.C. I mean, if people found out that, it would look bad. It could come back and people say, oh, she's, you know, her decisions are, mm -hmm. are at risk because of this. So for me, it was like I just had to make a choice. I had to decide I was going to do something different. And once I decided... And once I looked into how I might make this happen financially, it was like everything just fell into place. And so without a mortgage and without car payments and without all the things that come with owning a home and all those things and working, uh, I was able to travel the world for two and a half years and discover a lot, meet with spiritual leaders in Africa and India and Bangladesh and Brazil Chile, all over the world to find out what is this? What are we supposed to do with death and grief? How are we supposed to get through it? You know, our fast-paced society is one of get over it, get through it, move on. Well, most people can't do that with grief. Grief is different. I like when you say that you liken it to catching the flu because we think we're just going to get over this, but it, it's not. Right. We're not sick. There's no cure. You can't medicate it away. Right. Right, and, and part of that comes from the DSM, and the Diagnostic and Statistical Ma Manual has added a new diagnosis for extreme grief, right? And so people want to have it medicated away, turn us into zombies, but what if there's another way? What if there's a way to look at grief from a different perspective? And so everything in my book has to do with creating ceremony, sitting quietly, sitting with a candle and a notebook, um, and a pie pan because we're going to burn what we write so that we can be radically honest, so that we can get out of this physical realm and upload to our ceremonial brain, the neocortex, 
And in the neocortex, things begin to move like a feather blowing in the wind instead of at the physical realm where we're dragging things along in a heavy, heavy, heavy way. It's really to deal with that energy of grief. So totally the energy. We know that other life circumstances like parent, becoming a parent, becoming, uh, getting married, we know that has energy that's transformative. It's life-changing. But what our society kind of avoids is the life-saving energy of grief. If we can tap into that energy instead of becoming stuck and actually almost becoming, um, you know, it, it becomes almost a thing. You know, it becomes like we can't move um, with our grief. If we can tap into the energy of it and begin to move along, then we can create a new life, Um out of the ashes of the old that honors our loved one. And I think that's the big point because people sometimes feel they don't deserve to. Their loved one is gone. There's nothing to live for. Um, they, they, they shouldn't live for it. It would be dishonoring them to move on. But that, actually, the reverse is true. We do everything so, possible to bury that energy, to deny that energy. that It doesn't exist because we don't want to deal with it. We just want to pretend in some way that we're not feeling what we're feeling. Yeah, for sure. And, and society kind of encourages that, like the grieving widow, the grieving spouse. And, um, you know, it, it's that heavy energy, like we're showing the world how much we loved our loved one and or showing our loved one who's on the other side. And there's no win in grieving. So if you grieve too long, then people say, oh, she really needs help. If you don't grieve long enough, oh, she must not have cared. So you might as well take your own journey. And grieve as long as you feel that it's necessary to grieve. Do you think that it's possible to make peace with those regrets that you just spoke about? I think it is. There's so many times we get caught up in shame, blame, guilt, and judgment. And so that's why if you work through exercises like, who are you judging? Who's judging you in this whole thing? Or who was judging you? Or who who were you judging? I found out I was actually even judging my son. It's deep inside of me, I was really angry with him for for doing this, for trying heroin and going to a party, getting drunk and trying heroin. I was furious, right? So, and judging myself, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. And so many stories we tell each other, oh, I should have done this. Um, I should have made them go to the doctor. I should have done this differently. It was maybe a different school, maybe different friends. I should have moved. So we have all these stories rattling around in our house, our minds. And the heavy role of being the grieving, the widow, this, the grieving mother, what a heavy role. And so as we release them to the fire, right, so shamans work with fire. And and this is very common. So if we go to a church or we go to a temple and they have a place where we can light a candle for our loved ones, ah, we know that our prayers are being carried to the, by the smoke to the universe, to God, to whatever we believe in. So we're going to work with that concept of using smoke, of saying what we want to release. I'm going to release this and burning it and opening our hearts to new ways of thinking, believing, seeing. And that's part of the experience. It's like breathing in and breathing out, breathing in fresh new air, breathing out the old stale. So we're breathing, we're allowing the smoke to take all our old ways of judging and suffering and attachments and open our hearts to new ways. Karen, what are one or two of your favorite practices from your book, Living Grieving? i tell you my biggest one, and I love this practicing beauty, the beauty way. And what does that mean? So what I like to have people do is um, put a magnet or a piece of paper with a magnet on their refrigerator, practice beauty, and do one thing for yourself every day. One thing, a a piece of candy, a flower, um, a sunrise, a sunset, an art show, whatever it is, but get in the practice of doing something for yourself that you love, that brings beauty to your life every day. Because we get so lost in our grief that we're digging deeper and deeper the neural networks for shame, blame, grief, um, despair, hopelessness. So we want to begin building new neural networks that have to do with connecting with beauty and bringing beauty back into our lives because sometimes we've just lost it. Some people can lose it when they're a caregiver, when they've got children who are in the throes of um, addiction, 
um, and every day they don't know if they're going to live or die. And so we lose that beauty way. We lose our our ability to really tap into it. So we want to redo that. We want to reconnect with beauty. And I think that's really important because it encourages us to practice self-care because that's the one thing that we forget about when we're going through grief. We don't take care of ourselves, and that's really something that's vitally important. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, one thing, you know, maybe it's a massage, maybe it's a facial, whatever it is, one thing. And when you get in the habit, and I always have people say, I want you to do it for 30 days. And by the time you do it for 30 days, it becomes a new habit, a new way of being that allows us to see things in a different way. Karen, how can family members and friends support someone who's grieving? I mean, I I know when I was going through a lot of my loss and, and losing my family members, you kind of feel yourself that there's a time limit on it. Like, I should feel better by now. And people kind of say things that make you feel that way. So what is the best approach that a loved one can take to help someone navigate grief? So the people that helped me the most were people who just sat with me, made a cup of tea, said, how can I help? What can I do? And without judgment, without advice, all those old platitudes, oh, you know, he's in a better place. Oh, forget that. Mm. Don't say those things. Right. <laughs> in a better agree. place. Right. All these things that we say because we don't know what to say. So what if we don't say anything? What if we just sit, allow people to grieve, and respect their journey? I think somehow we've lost respect for the bereaved. In other cultures like the Lakota, the bereaved are considered closer to spirit. And so people want to be around them because they know that they have this beautiful connection with spirit. But we kind of see people as a pariah, like, "Uh uh-oh, here she is. Oh, it's going to be a bummer. Oh, this is going to be heavy. Oh, here we go again. Right? So I think we have to relax our attitudes about that and allow people to grieve in their own time, in their own way, and just allow people to, to, to talk, to grieve, to bring them into events. So, you know, sometimes we want to say, well, we want to talk. Let's not talk about that at this birthday party. What, talk about the elephant in the room? Let's not talk about that, right? right. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous because we, we, we want to make ourselves feel better. But what about right. the person who's actually grieving? We forget about them. Why do you think certain cultures have been able to maintain seeing the beauty in, in various life experiences? And, and we don't. Like you said, we treat people like, oh, here she comes. This is going to be a downer. Right. Like, why do you think we've lost that? Because we're so afraid of death and dying. I mean, if you get boil it all down to it, most of us have a terrible fear of death. We know that we are all going to die, right? I mean, nobody's come out of this life alive yet. And yet we want to forget about that. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to deal with it. And when someone dies and someone's grieving, it kind of brings it right in our face, like our mortality. And a lot of people have to face, you know, our belief system. Do you believe in life after death? I didn't. And then I did, right? So we can change our beliefs. Um, What if we don't die to everything? What if we have a beautiful experience on the other side? So a lot of people who have had near-death experiences have written many, many books about near-death experiences and find that there's a lot more on the other side than what we think. And so what we've been told about heaven and hell, oh, my gosh, I might go to hell. Oh, wait. So nobody, we don't want to, we want to avoid all that discussion. But what if it's different? What if it's not that? The book is Living Grieving, Using Energy Medicine to Alchemize Grief and Loss. If you'd like to get more information about Karen and her work, you can visit karenjohnson.net. Karen, in our final moments, what is the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? I'd like people to know that we are hardwired for transformation. Um, We have this innate desire for transformation. And when we don't transform our grief and it becomes stuck inside of us, it really can be harmful. So many of my clients and people I see, if they have immune disorders, cancers, just various kind of illnesses, if I, we go back far enough, we find unresolved grief and loss. So I really encourage people to work with their grief and loss and not avoid it. 
not say, oh, I'm just going to stomp this down. I'm going to put a lid on it. I'm going to just pretend everything is okay because it can pop out up later in many, many ways that are not um, good for our wellness and health. Karen, thank you so much for joining us. So many people today are experiencing the pain of grief and your story and your book really offers us hope. So I'm so happy that you're here to share this with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.